Welcome back to the St. Baldrick's Impact Series. I'm Kathleen Reddy, and today I'm pleased to welcome Dr. David Malkin. Dr. Malkin is Professor of Pediatrics and Medical Biophysics at the University of Toronto. He's also the Director of the Cancer Genetics Program and a senior scientist at a a senior scientist in the Genetics and Genome Biology Program at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. He co-leads the Sick Kids Precision Child Health Initiative and their Cancer Sequencing Program, which integrates and translates next generation sequencing into clinical care for children with cancer. He directs the Pan-Canadian Multi-Institutional Precision Oncology for Young People Initiative and that aim is to incorporate next-gen sequencing into novel clinical trials or precision oncology for children and young adults with hard to cure cancers. Besides all that, his research interests obviously focus on genetic and genomic mechanisms of child to cancer susceptibility, and he's working to develop rational clinical surveillance and treatment approaches for children and adults at genetic high risk of, for cancer. Not surprisingly, he's received numerous awards recognizing his clinical research and mentorship work, most recently being elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Congratulations and welcome, Dr. Malkin. Thank you so much, Kathleen. It's great to be here and uh, look forward to uh, chatting with you. Great. Well, let's jump right in, shall we? Sure. Um, so hereditary cancers, I know that they start in the germline. But what does that mean? And how does all this work create new hope for pa cancer patients? So the concept of hereditary cancer really is, um, is, I think, relatively simple in mind. And that is that until, oh, I would say maybe 10 years ago, maybe not even that long ago, it was thought that um, most cancers altogether were caused by environmental uh, influences. Um, we think of tobacco and sun and uh, radiation and various other exposures. But as we have done around the world more and more genetic studies, it's become apparent that a significant portion of childhood cancers do have an underlying genetic component, meaning that the child has inherited or maybe just spontaneously um, at conception um, developed a mutation, a change in a particular gene, which predisposed them to the cancer that they ultimately develop. Um, so it's changed our, to a certain degree, our entire approach to thinking about how we can start tackling the problem of childhood cancer by going right back, as you said, right back to the germline, right back to the beginning, and not necessarily just staying with the cancer when it occurs. Um, I was going to say, I mean, most of the recent studies, including one that you, you mentioned in the introduction, this um, Sick Kids Cancer Sequencing Program we call KICKS. And in that one, which was just published, uh, the first 300 patients sequenced, about 17, so 17 percent of them uh, have a underlying genetic mutation. Um, so that's, you know, approaching a quarter, which is quite high. Mm -hmm fascinating how just our understanding of what's true is is changing um yes. drastically yeah. so hereditary cancers until recently kind of playing off what you were just saying were thought to account for about five percent of cancers in children mm -hmm. but i understand that's changed and how did that discovery come about so the main so the the Cancer that we call the paradigm for hereditary cancer has actually been around for at least 100 years, and that's retinoblastoma. That's a tumor that I think many people have heard about. It involves the retina of the eye. And it can either be um, in two eyes, meaning bilateral, that uh, the child is either born or it develops two retinoblastomas, or it can be in one eye at one site. And back about six, almost 60 years ago, um, a brilliant scientist named uh, Dr. Alfred Knudsen in Philadelphia came up with this theory or hypothesis to explain that. And the hypothesis was that people or children who inherited a mutation in the retinoblastoma gene are more likely to develop retinoblastoma in both eyes or multiple tumors and those who just developed it sporadically in one eye. And that 
kind of stuck. And that was the only tumor really that was around, for, thought to fit that model for many, many, many years. As we started to do more of this deep, deep sequencing and, um, of, of uh, the genome in kids with cancer, we started to uncover all these other um, sort of patterns of inheritance and patterns of genetic changes that were actually and are actually associated with a wide variety of cancer types. And we now understand that there's at least 50 different kind of hereditary cancers um, affecting children uh, with those, sometimes it's brain tumors or um, uh, sarcomas, the soft tissue tumors or bone tumors or uh, of the kidney. It's pretty much almost every organ you can think of, there's some genetic connection to. So when you think about how frequently those different cancers occur in children, you're talking about substantial numbers of kids, really, amongst the cancer population. It could be, even though it might be 50% of the known cancers in kids, it might be more than 50% of the children who have cancer based upon how common that type of cancer is. Yeah, I don't think it's probably, I mean, we don't think it's probably around 50. We're probably talking more in the 20, 25% range at okay. the moment, at the moment. So I don't want it to sound too, too much mm -hmm. higher than that. However, that's, that's just sort of what we're saying is a single gene being the problem. Now the technology is getting very, very clever. And we're starting to think, ah, the genes work together. They play with each other. They interact with each other. And there may very well, and there probably are scenarios where we call it polygenic meaning there's the individual child has either an inherited or acquired multiple genetic events, which are together predisposing them. That science is still to come, but the suspicion is actually that that's probably the case. So we don't know what the final percentage will be. I think it'll be more than 20 or 25%. It won't be 100%. It may not even be 50, but it, like you said, uh, actually, Kathleen, it will be significant. It'll be substantial. Mm -hmm. So dovetailing off that, I understand you're an expert in Lee-Fraumeni syndrome. Is that unique to children? And how? what is it and how does it impact patients? So Lee-Fraumeni syndrome is uh, named after the two um, amazing medical oncologists and epidemiologists who f first described it. Um, uh, Drs. Fred Lee and Dr. Joe Frameni. Dr. Joe Frameni is, I think, in his early 90s now and still uh, very active. He's at the National Institutes of Health. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Lee, who is one of my close mentors um, in Boston, passed away a number of years ago. But they described this um, um, sort of scenario uh, based on looking at children with rhabdomyosarcoma, one of the common soft tissue tubers of muscle, and found that um, um, a, a small number of these kids had a strong family history of cancer, particularly a mother or an aunt with breast cancer. They described this and then it took 20 years. I was in 1969. And then in 1989, um, I was in a very fortunate position to be doing my postdoc with Dr. Steve Friend and Dr. Lee in Boston. And we, um, we were looking at different possible causes for this and found that uh, uh, inherited mutations of a gene called p53 are associated with Lee-Fraumeni syndrome and actually are the cause. Um, and this particular gene, p53, is critically important because what its job is is to um, protect our genome, our entire genetic structure, from damage. So when, when there is damage to the DNA, p53 kind of becomes active, becomes alive, and, and sort of uh, instructs a whole bunch of other proteins to try to correct or, or, or uh, correct the damage, or if that doesn't work to actually just tell the cell to commit suicide and then the cell of it. But if the P53 gene is mutated or altered, like in these individuals, like in these families, then those cells can start dividing and dividing and dividing and cancers can develop. And because in patients with Lee-Fraumeni, the gene is mutated in every single cell in their body, then virtually every organ in their body is potentially at risk to develop a cancer. Um, so it's it's really quite a remarkable thing. And the lifetime risk in, in males is somewhere up around 75%, females 100%, but it's not just children, it's adults as well. Um, so about 40% of the tumors occur 
before the age of 20 to 25, and the rest are more in, the, uh, in adults. So as you're talking about the, um, the fact that P53, if a mutation exists, and I, I'd like you to tell us what might cause a mutation, mm -hmm. but if, if that mutation exists, it affects every cell in the body. So it sounds like you're saying there could be a whole host of, of different cancers that one patient could experience. That's right. I'll get back to the what causes it, but absolutely right to that second point is that um, when, when kids or adults uh, are, uh, develop their first tumor, and uh, then we as oncologists go in and we treat it accordingly and they, and they, um, they survive that first career, but then they're at risk of getting another one or another one or another. And um, so as some of the parents and the children themselves have said to me, it's sort of like Damocles sword. It's that sword hanging over their head when they know that yes, they may be cured of tumor number one, but they're not sure if and when and where tumor number two or three or four or five will come along. One of my patients, he's 18, he's off to university doing amazing in engineering and so on. He's had four different malignancies and he's only 18. So that is not an unusual scenario and often the families are affected. What causes the mutations in P53 is a really good question and not an easy one to answer because we really ultimately don't know. Basically, um, you know, mistakes, if you will, in our genome are occurring at a pretty rapid rate in entirely healthy individuals. And, um, and normally they're corrected. But if a mutation just spontaneously occurs in the P53 gene at the wrong place at the wrong time, then, then it sticks and, and it's there. Um, and, and then every generation of cell um, after that carries it forward. But it's not entirely clear, you know, what exactly it is in the germ line that causes the mutations. We know for sure uh, P53 is extremely commonly mutated in tumors themselves, just the sporadic, the, the far more, you know, the world of cancer. At least 50 to 60 percent of all human cancers will have a mutation in that gene just in the cancer itself. But those are primarily caused by external things like tobacco. We know that to tobacco causes mutations in P53. We know that radiation does. We know that sun uh, radiation does. We know that other chemicals do. That's totally different than what happens in, a, in an inherited context. I hope that so makes sense. <laughs> it, it does, and it's fascinating. And I would imagine that once you know what causes a mutation, it'll be much more clear how to prevent that mutation from yes. happening, or if there's an intervent intervention to be made to kind of nip it in the bud, so to speak, to um, prevent the cancer from developing, right? And or yes, you know, becoming life threatening. I would imagine. So, so utilizing all this knowledge that you have thus far. How does this change the way physicians treat patients or monitor patients who maybe um, have fit, completed their initial treatment? So both those, so actually we, uh, there are certain tumor types that are very common in the context of leaf romani syndrome. And so if a child presents even with an out of, without a family history of cancer with one or more of these or one of these particular tumors, we and the rest of the medical community uh, would recommend them for P53 testing. And if the test turns out to be positive or they carry the mutation in the gene, then not only are we talking about treating the tumor they have, but then we have lifetime monitoring and surveillance ongoing for the detection, early detection of other cancers. If a family presents uh, and, and um, has a child and the child has no cancer, but the family, let's say the mom or the dad, has already been shown to carry mutation, then they will be referred for genetic counseling. We would recommend and we test for the child. And if the child carries a mutation in the gene, then we start immediately the surveillance protocol. We designed this in Toronto a number of years ago, and it's now used around the world. And it really involves... Uh, MRI imaging, ultrasounds every three months, physical exam, very careful attention to symptoms and so on, and some blood work. 
And with that in place, um, we and others have now shown that you can actually, like you said, Kathleen, nip it in the bud. So we, we don't know yet how to prevent these cancers, but we do know that if you pick them up early, and uh, I just got off the uh, phone with one of my neurosurgical colleagues of one of my patients that we have a very, very small four millimeter lesion, which looks like a low grade glioma. And uh, that was picked up on a routine surveillance scan, completely healthy child. Uh, and the plan is to um, go and take it out before it becomes a high grade glioma. Um, so that's the approach. It's very aggressive surveillance and it's very um, rapid attention to anything that's not normal and then jump in and appropriately manage it that way to, to try to uh, prevent symptoms. It will prevent the tumor from actually growing. Um, I would imagine that for some parents, um, if, if they have cancer or another family member who's an adult, that's a little bit different than if you are considering putting your child through testing because you don't want to scare your child, but you certainly don't want to let a problem develop and get ahead of you, right? You want to be ahead of the problem. So do parents have a difficult struggle, like ethical, moral question about whether to do that with their child? So um, it, it, I think the answer is probably a bit of yes and no, and it's definitely very dependent on all our individual moral compasses mm -hmm. of how we make decisions like this. Um, what I can say, there's a, quite a bit of uh, work in the literature and the psychosocial literature in particular exploring that question. And the general sense is that the vast majority of parents, while they do struggle with the decision often at the beginning, at the end of the day, decide that the that if it will benefit their child by potentially um, uh, nipping it in the bud, then it is worth the testing. And what we do with the very young children who obviously can't understand or appreciate that is we use as many tools as we can to start teaching them as they grow older. And the mom of one of my patients who was five or six at the time uh, wrote a wonderful uh, book, children's book, which is written um, in from the perspective of a young child meant for children to read in the six to eight year range um, of what it's like to go through testing and surveillance and and it's a fun little adventure. Um, and uh, this is the kind of education that we, we do need. Mm -hmm. As they get older, absolutely. We sometimes find children as they hit their teen years and get a much better understanding. They really want to explore um, why the testing was done because you can't go backwards and then um, take more um, aim. But, but the, the comment that I've heard over and over is the testing and the surveillance really gives families, parents, children, this sense of some empowerment over a disease that they really don't otherwise have much control. And mm -hmm. that's um, that in and of itself, I think, is what drives them. And it takes away a lot of that fear, I would imagine, because they feel like the disease doesn't have the upper hand on them. They have this army of medical professionals behind them and all this in incredible diagnostic equipment and so forth to help them um, get ahead of problems. And I would imagine for kids, the, the, the story you shared about the book, um, putting it into kind of the context of an adventure would, I think, be very empowering and reassuring to a young child. Yes. And the other thing that we've been doing, we have a study going on currently, and there's others similarly, is um, we know and we understand um, any of us who've had any form of a medical test whether it be a blood test, an ultrasound, an MRI, uh, any sort, there is some stress and anxiety going into that until you get the result back to know that everything is okay. Well, we know for sure that these families, parents and kids go through that um, cycle um, every few months as, as they're seen. So we're doing studies with uh, psychologists and some of our um, artificial intelligence colleagues in trying to um, monitor uh, this sense of stress so that if we can determine uh, the balance between the benefit of the surveillance and the stress of the surveillance and try to mitigate that um, as much as possible. And the other part of that story is we and others are now exploring 
other ways to do the surveillance, particularly using um, blood derived markers. So instead of having MRIs and all sorts of other things, which which also have significant insurance um, uh, uh, um, issues associated with it, uh, are there other simpler tests that we can do that might be able to detect tumors um, ahead of time and then uh, deal with them that way? So that's still to be determined, but very promising. But it sounds like you have a huge body of evidence that's come from the surveillance that proves that early surveillance saves lives. Yes, there's no question in my mind that that's true. Um, so from my perspective, I don't have any trouble. I don't lose sleep over the surveillance. We know that it's making a difference. Uh, we want to refine it. We want to fine tune it. The, the you know, it, it's still not good enough that we can, as, as we said near the beginning, a, a patient can develop cancer when they're one year old, or they may not develop their first cancer until they're, they're 40. So you can imagine putting somebody through 40 years of surveillance. And in fact, they never needed it until they were closer to 40. So we really need to do to to refine and understand better for a particular patient. When is it likely they will develop cancer and what types of cancer? And then we can refine the surveillance. And I'm hoping that that will really make a make a significant difference in how we do this sort of thing, because I know we're doing more surveillance than we need to for some patients. Mm -hmm. And um, it'd be nice to back off. Certainly. So one of your team members is Dr. Adam Schlein, a 2019 recipient of the St. Baldrick's Robert JRCC Innovation Award. How is Dr. Schlein's work contributing to the advances you've been describing today? So uh, Dr. Schlein is uh, working with us on a couple of areas. We were still work very closely together. He was a PhD student of mine, actually, and uh, and then went off, did a postdoc at the Sanger Institute, which is the Cambridge University in, in the UK, and then has been back with us for uh, about 10 years now. Um, so he, he's uh, not an MD. He's a PhD scientist and is very focused and interested in um, the translation of genomic understanding the cancer genome to clinical action. So he co-leads with me the Sick Kids Cancer Sequencing Program, as well as another colleague of mine, Dr. Anita Villani, who was one of our fellows and was the lead author on the surveillance team. So it's an amazing little trio that we've got here and many, many more. Dr. Schlein's work in there is really to, um, is two areas. One is he's understanding, doing work to understand and dissect out the um, genetic alterations that occur in sarcomas, um, in the bone tumors, the muscle tumors, the connective tissue tumors. And he's now working with me and with others, uh, having collected about a thousand of these tumors and doing deep sequencing. And this will give us a much better understanding of what's happening at the genetic level and the molecular level for these tumors, that when, then we can start thinking of better ways to treat them. Um, so that in and of itself is not uh, specific to the Lee Frameni story, but to the Lee Frameni story, uh, we've um, just completed a study that um, using his super expertise in genome sciences, taking the same thing, but instead of sequencing, uh, deep, deep sequencing of the uh, of uh, sarcomas, we took a number of um, patients' tumors with Lee Frameni syndrome, different types of tumors, deeply, deeply, deeply sequenced the DNA, the RNA to look at them. And with that information, we have been able to uncover that there are some certain patterns of genetic alterations in addition to the P53 mutation, which is in everybody, other alterations, which look like they may be somewhat unique to a cancer that occurs in a person with Lee Frameni syndrome for the, from the same cancer that occurs somewhere else. With that information, we can start thinking, aha, if there is a clue from that signature that Dr. Schlein's been working that we could actually pick up in the blood, then we could develop the blood test that would be very specific for that particular patient because we know what type of tumor that particular patient might develop. So we're now working with some other colleagues to take the work that Adam's done in dissecting out the genome of Lee Frameni tumors to say, aha, maybe we can come up with a true diagnostic test. And 
with that information will be much more precise in the way we do surveillance. And the last piece I'll say about that is that his work and this incredible use of mathematics and various computational things that I don't really, to be honest, totally understand how it works, um, able to actually show that these two, the molecular changes that these tumors, uh, they start years before the cancer actually manifests. So your point about nipping it in the bud yeah, we now can nip it in the bud when we see it's a few millimeters big. But if we now know it's actually been there molecularly, tiny, like sub-visual, a long time before, which means we can probably think of ways that we can nip it in the bud before it even becomes visible. And that would be truly a concept of prevention. Um, so... Yeah. That's exciting. And that's really what every human being wants to hear is that we can get to the stage where we might be able to prevent cancer. And you're talking about getting it earlier and earlier and earlier. And I think your discussion day, it's not only fascinating, and we could probably do 10 episodes just with you easily. <laughs> um, I think what you've done is also helped educate us as to why research is so darn complex and so exacting and takes time because this, all of this layering, peeling back the layers of the onion, help us understand you get deeper and deeper into the, the essence of a human being right. and figuring out where things go awry and what, how to fix those. Totally. And I think, you know, St. Baldrick is very, his focus, of course, his mission is related to childhood cancer. And one of the things that I think I've learned and, and sort of knew, I guess, but now I've really learned and, and over the years is that many of the um, discoveries that have had um, important uh, importance in terms of, of um, developing new therapies and new treatments and so on for adult cancer, which of course occur at a much, much more commonly, many of those fundamental genetic genomic discoveries have come from the study of childhood cancer. And so I like to say is that the, the children really still lead the way when it comes to uh, pediatric oncology and, and cancer research generally, because fundamentally, um, they're it, it, it's a cleaner model. Yes, we're peeling mm -hmm. lots of onions, but we know at least that there's a, not a lot of all these 40, 50, 60 years of other things which have um, triggered the cancer. It's a right. cleaner model. So we've our understanding of childhood cancer has actually led to a better understanding of human cancer generally. Fascinating. Well, there you have it, audience. The exact reason I couldn't have had a better endorsement to, and rationale for supporting St. Baldrick's to promote life-saving childhood cancer research. It will pay dividends to other patients as well. Dr. Malkin, I want to thank you so much for dedicating your career to this important avenue of study. And um, it, it's incredible. And I think we're all getting a better sense of the potential and how it might change the field in the future. And create more hope for kids with cancer. Um, and to our entire audience, I want to thank you for dedicating your volunteer and giving power to life-saving childhood cancer research. Please share this episode on your social media channels and tune in next time in March to hear St. Baldrick's founder, John Bender. Remember, research is hope and you are the giver of hope. Learn how at stbaldricks.org.